During the PS2 era, Japan was the undeniable king of horror. Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Clock Tower, it felt like every major horror release on that console was by a Japanese developer. I suppose it makes sense, given that Japanese horror cinema had a boom of its own in the late 90s and early 2000s. The same creativity probably seeped into video games as well. And yet, notice how despite all of these games being developed in Japan, none of them are actually set in Japan. This could have just been to appeal to a more international market, or just because foreign settings were more exciting to Japanese developers, I don't know, but regardless, it took a while for a game with a Japanese setting to come along and fill this gap in the horror video game market. Enter Fatal Frame, one of the first to take on the challenge, developed by Tecmo. The series director, Makoto Shibata, felt there was untapped potential in a horror game set in Japan, and wanted to make a game that contrasted other major horror releases at the time, both in setting and in enemy design. Resident Evil as zombies, Silent Hill as monsters, but Shibata wanted to focus on a kind of fear that is very prevalent in Japanese culture. Ghosts. In a 2008 interview reflecting on the franchise, Shibata described the two core elements of Fatal Frame that helped shape their vision for the first game, and eventually the entire franchise. When I first proposed the idea for Fatal Frame, I incorporated two elements that I suppose you could say are the rough blueprint for any Fatal Frame game. For one, I wanted the game to take place in a Japanese traditional style house. In those kind of old-fashioned houses, there's a lot of nooks and crannies and areas tucked behind sliding screens and doors that are too dark to see. I wanted to make a horror game that capitalized on that darkness. A horror game where, just standing there, you felt afraid. Secondly, I wanted there to be some kind of mechanic that requires you to capture the ghosts. When you're looking at something scary, like a ghost or a spirit, you don't really want to look directly at it, right? But I wanted to create a system that meant if you didn't directly face the ghosts, you wouldn't be able to defeat them. And this is how the idea of using a camera to capture the ghosts was born. According to the same interview, the camera mechanic was initially met with some backlash from the series producer, but they eventually warmed to the idea and ended up releasing the game in 2002 on the PS2 and Xbox. Basing the entirety of your IP on a very experimental mechanic was quite a ballsy choice for Tecmo, so how did it turn out? Let's find out. Wow, listen to this music. You just don't get title cards like this anymore. Oh, yeah, this game released as Project Zero in Europe. It's actually a lot closer to the Japanese name for the game, which is just Zero. And of course, the American name is Fatal Frame. Definitely what the franchise is most commonly known as nowadays. I was always fond of Fatal Frame the most anyway. Sure, it's a little bit cheesy as a name, but it's at least more memorable than Project Zero, which doesn't really tell you anything about the game. So, we start off playing as Mafuyu just as he's about to enter a mansion deep in the forest. We hear a narration from his sister, Miku, who explains that they've both been seeing visions as long as they can remember. She explains that Mafuyu is searching for a famous novelist, Junsei Takemine, who disappeared along with his colleagues while researching for his newest book. This led Mafuyu to go to his last known whereabouts, Himido Mansion. This brief chapter acts as a short and sweet tutorial, giving us a chance to get used to the controls. It's here that we are also introduced to the Camera Obscura, a camera with mystical properties that was passed down to Mafuyu and Miku from their late mother, and your main form of defense against enemies in this game. This camera has the power to expose things the normal eye can't see. I remember the incident from which I learned of its unique power to capture ghosts. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, side note, the voice acting in this game, it's, it's, it's not good. I'd even say this is some of the most lifeless voice acting I've heard in a video game period. All the characters sound so robotic, there's not really any point in the game where they vary their delivery or, you know, actually sound scared. <laughs> to add salt to the wound, there's no Japanese language option available either. I'm not one of those people who immediately writes off dubs as being inferior, in fact, there's some Japanese franchises that I've always been more keen listening to in English, but I always found that if a game has a very distinctly Japanese setting, hearing the character speak English is just… jarring? Unnatural? It's like the Yakuza games, they're very clearly set in modern day Japan, so if anything, hearing any language other than Japanese kinda kills the immersion, right? 
at least it does for me. I get that dubbing it makes it more accessible to Western audiences, but come on guys, if you're gonna go through that effort, put a little bit more heart into it. Regardless, Matthew ends up being attacked, and the game then hands us over to Miku, who reveals to us that he's been missing for two weeks, leading her to search for him. Finding the camera obscura, she realizes her brother is in serious danger, and decides to explore the mansion further to find out what happened. Did something happen to my brother? A lot of the gameplay, whether it's the combat or the exploration, is centered around the use of the camera obscura. The camera has supernatural properties that allow it to sense ghosts in the environment. When you're near an apparition or a point of interest, this indicator in the corner will glow, where it then becomes a game of hot and cold trying to find what you're looking for. This means you'll find yourself using the camera not only as a defense against vengeful spirits, but also to solve puzzles and progress the story. For example, here, the indicator glows as you pass the small chest. Trying to open it reveals that it's locked, but if you snap a picture of it, it'll show you another location where you can find the key item necessary for unlocking it. The game really makes good use of the camera mechanic for both exploration and combat, and it works really well in making the experience very unique from other survival horrors at the time. But that's just the exploration side of things. Let's talk about the combat a little bit. Your only defense against the ghosts in the entire game is the camera obscura. So, when you're aiming the camera, you need to line up the ghost in the circular reticle here. Doing so will fill up a bar at the bottom of the screen, which powers your shot. When it reaches max, you hit R1 to snap a picture of the ghost, dealing damage. But here's the catch. The closer you are to an enemy, the faster the meter will charge. It's very much a risk and reward system. Dispatching of an enemy quickly really means you have to put yourself in danger and get pretty up close and personal with the ghost. The more of a charge you have, the bigger the damage, but there can also be scenarios where purposefully using a weaker charge shot can help you. Sometimes a weaker shot can stun an enemy, giving you a chance to run away. Though, naturally enough, it does little to no damage. This system adds a level of strategy to the gameplay and stops it from getting too repetitive. Shoot them enough times and they'll go poof, leaving you alone, at least for a while. Beyond the encounters, you can also sometimes catch glimpses of non-hostile ghosts in the environment as you explore. It could just be a ghost standing above you out of view, or seeing one run past you quickly. Not only do they serve as a good spook to keep you on your toes, but if you're fast enough to take a picture, it gives you a nice chunk of spirit points. Spirit points are a currency you can spend on upgrading your camera. Range widens the capture circle, speed obviously speeds up how quickly the camera charges, and max value increases how much the camera can charge in a single shot. This menu is also where you can change the type of film you're using. Film effectively being your ammo throughout the game. Type 14, Type 37, Type 74, and Type 90 film. Simply put, the higher the number, the stronger it is against ghosts. The basic Type 14 film can be reloaded at save points, but the other film types can only be found through exploration. Some of them are incredibly rare too, so if you find yourself with a Type 74 or higher, you'll want to be holding on to it for boss fights. There's other items you can use in the heat of combat as well. You can find spirit zones throughout the game which allow you to use special abilities. Things like slowing the ghost down temporarily, or making the ghost easier to see, and so on. Each time you use one of these abilities, it uses up one spirit stone, so you really gotta make each shot count. There's also stone mirrors, which give you an instant full heal if your health fully depletes mid-battle. Weirdly enough, you can only hold one of these at a time. As far as I'm aware, it's the only item in the game that actually has a limit on how many you can hold. I get that they're fairly OP by nature, but you'd think they'd also limit how many spirit stones you can hold in which case. Definitely one of the standout features of this game are the ghosts themselves, though. No matter how much of a survival horror veteran you are, the ghost encounters can really get under your skin. They phase in and out of vision and can teleport around you in the blink of an eye, slowly creeping towards you until you snap that shot. A lot of the ghosts either cry out in pain or beg you to help them, and it really kind of makes you feel a certain level of empathy for them. Not only are they interesting in their design, but also in how they function. The AI is pretty varied in that each ghost's behavior is a little bit different from the last. Funnily enough, while Matthew and Miku's voice acting is quite poor in my opinion, I found the voice work for the ghost to be pretty effective. The combination of the music mixed with the ghost cries makes for a very unsettling experience. There were more than a few times where I felt a flood of relief after taking down a particularly strong ghost. It's a very intense style of horror, and it works wonderfully. 
If you've ever watched the original Japanese versions of The Ring or The Grudge and liked the spooks in those, you'll feel right at home here. Some scenes even feel like direct nods to those films as well. I did find it surprising though that there's an entire dodge mechanic that's not even mentioned in the game. If you time it correctly and press the X button when a ghost grabs you, you can shake them off and take minimal damage. Sometimes no damage at all if your timing is spot on. Unless I missed it, this isn't mentioned in any of the tutorials. The ghosts can hit pretty hard too, so honestly I don't know how they missed this. It took me a while to realise you could even shake off ghosts at all. Thankfully though, the ghost encounters are paced pretty well. Some encounters are fixed, while others are a bit more randomised, but it never feels like you're overwhelmed with endless battles. That being said, there's a little bit of a difficulty spike on the third night. If you do find yourself starting this game, try to go into the third night with some healing items on you. There's a lot of forced ghost encounters and very little healing items to find. It kind of caught me off guard, not gonna lie. During moments of peace when you're not fighting ghosts, however, are when you'll be solving puzzles and progressing through the mansion. As for the puzzles themselves, they're kinda hit and miss. The biggest mistake the game makes is it tends to repeat puzzles quite often, more specifically the sliding puzzles. It kind of felt like the devs just couldn't think of any new fresh puzzle ideas, so they just said, oh, slap another one of those sliding ones in there and the player won't mind. Definitely the most interesting puzzles are the ones that incorporate the camera, in my opinion, and thankfully there's plenty of those to balance out the less interesting puzzles. Solving those puzzles, however, can be a little bit of a pain. Not because they're difficult, but because you move really slowly in this game. You might have already noticed it in the gameplay, but Miku runs at a very sluggish pace. I don't know if you can even call that running, it's more like frolicking? You do get used to it after a while, but at the beginning of the game I found myself frustrated at the walking speed, especially during combat when you might want to make a fast escape. I mean, look at how slowly Miku goes down this ladder, like seriously? I don't know if this is to build tension or what, but oh my god, Miku, please, move. I'm going to start discussing the plot of this game a little bit. If you'd rather not hear anything about it, then please skip to this time. Okay? Okay, let's go. As you explore the mansion, you quickly find out what became of the research crew. All of them were brutally murdered, with rope burns left on their arms and legs. First, you find Ogata and Hirasaka, the assistants, before finally Takamine himself, all as ghosts. However, Miku was playing with fire coming to Himuro Mansion, and by the end of the first night, she finds herself afflicted with the same curse. After being attacked by a ghost in a white dress, she too has those same rope burns. We discovered that there was an old ritual that used to take place on the grounds of the mansion, called a Strangling Ritual. A young girl would be selected as Rope Shrine Maiden, and after ten years of being locked away from the world, she'd be sacrificed, with ropes being tied to her limbs and neck, tearing her body apart. This was done to keep the Hellgate beneath the mansion closed, the only thing keeping back malevolent forces from unleashing chaos on the world. Kirie was one of the girls destined to be a Rope Shrine Maiden, but she fell in love with a man living on the mansion grounds. When her family discovered she had fallen in love, they had the man killed. Upset over his death, the ritual ended up being a failure and the Hellgate opened, killing most of the mansion residents and causing the rest to go insane. The malice also tainted Kirie, turning her into a vengeful spirit on a warpath, cursing and killing anyone who got in her way. My biggest gripe with the story isn't the content matter. It's an alright plot, nothing mind-blowing, but not bad by any means. My issue is with how it's told. The majority of the plot and world building is fed to the player through diaries and documents. There is a lot of reading in this game. I'm not opposed to this personally, but a lot of people don't have the patience to be reading four to five page documents. But, on the other hand, if you do skip these documents, you won't have a clue what is going on in the narrative. I personally always found excessive documents in games to be very lazy storytelling. Instead of trying to communicate the story visually or through other creative means, you're literally just handing the lore dump to the player. Like, look at this for example. One really nice detail that completely went over my head the first time I played Fatal Frame was the mansion slowly becomes less and less run down as the story progresses as if you yourself are going back in time to the days of the ritual as you learn more about the mansion's dark history. It's subtle, it's great, and I wish there was more of this visual storytelling instead of having to read dozens of lore dumps the game scatters around the place. Yes, Fatal Frame unfortunately does fall victim to this kind of storytelling, but I would argue that the combat and haunting ambience of the mansion makes up for it. The game manages to maintain a very chilling atmosphere throughout, so even if the plot is a little weak, the adventure more than makes up for it. 
but I have to say, the environments could have done with a little bit more variety. You'll be seeing a lot of dark, muddy brown textures in this game, and not much else. There's a brief section where you go to the small shrine surrounded in forestry, and I found it to be such a nice breath of fresh air from the rest of the environments. I think more of that kind of variety would have served the game well. You're probably looking at 7-8 to eight hours on a first playthrough for Fatal Frame. The game offers two endings, three if you're lucky enough to be playing the Xbox version, most of which can only be unlocked on the game's higher difficulties. Yeah, this game has multiple difficulties, and they boast a great challenge for anyone wanting to test their abilities with the Camera Obscura. There's also unlockable costumes and a battle game, which is effectively a series of one-on-one -on -one battles with ghosts where you can gun for high ranks. For anyone still looking for more to do after the main story, you've definitely got another few hours of content to mess around with. While the story and its execution leave something to be desired, Fatal Frame more than makes up for it elsewhere. The camera mechanic was a risky endeavour for the dev team, but it paid off, making for a battle system that's as terrifying as it is engaging. Though this game apparently pales in comparison to its sequel, Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly, Fatal Frame was still a really strong start for the franchise and remains a cult classic horror title to this day. Certainly, anyone looking to expand their PS2 horror catalogue, this game is a must. Now, if we could get a Fatal Frame that continues to build on an already solid battle system and manage to pull off an engaging story, we'd be hitting the jackpot. I wonder does Crimson Butterfly manage to deliver? Guess we'll have to find out. Yo! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'm really looking forward to jumping into some more Fatal Frame. If you want more of this kind of content, I stream horror games three times a week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, over on my Twitch. Or if you want some more updates on future videos and all that jazz, hit me up on Twitter. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.